Welcome everyone. Seventh Annual Cocktail Product Symposium. We have such a good time visiting and enjoying each other's company and stories when we get here. We really scrap the time and my time piece is strapped to the bar over there somewhere in the behind. But we're right on time if your clock's about 30 minutes slow. So we're gonna, we'll just move on. So I'm trying this year. That is streaming our symposium live to the internet via Ustream. So the whole world, if you're watching, uh, it's the first experiment for us. But we'll, uh, <coughs> I see some new faces. I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, we are so glad to have you back year after year. And, uh, we'll keep coming. We'll keep trying to, to do this for you. Tell your friends and bring them along. Um, let's get rolling here. We're going to have a panel discussion first, and we'll have another one for us so we can visit and then we're uh, going to get into a little bit of information about the Cockroach and Mark Money Lake Company. Right now, I'll turn it over to the moderator for the panel discussion, Dr. Harley Davis. Now, 
do each one of them in a few minutes here. And you're going to do the same. The women's all built to, uh, to each of the separate unions, and now then we'll tell you more about unions a little bit later. It was a real important part for the railroad, and I'm going to let her take that. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. My mother was very involved in Rebecca Lodge and the Brotherhood of Roadwood and the Iron Engineers, also Rebecca's. Uh, although my dad was killed in a train wreck in Mount Pleasant, uh, in 1945, my mother remained very active in Rebecca's, and uh, I'm not sure if she, I don't recall if she held an office or not, but uh, when I graduated from high school, my mother was a delegate to a convention, a Rebecca convention in San Francisco, and being, you know, railroad, I couldn't get a free pass until I was 21. So took advantage of that, and uh, my mother said, well, you can take a friend with you. So you'll have a friend while I'm in the meetings. So I chose uh, Yvonne Eckhart, and her dad was railroad, of course. Then she had a pass, and it was wonderful. We had a pool, we had a sleeper, we had a chance to eat in the dining room, um, the train, we changed trains at Fort Worth and took the Texas and Pacific out of Fort Worth and it was just the most wonderful trip and I can just visualize it now. Going to the dining room and you're eating on these starch white paper cloths. You have the silver that has the stamp emblem of the DMV on there and so while my mother was in meetings, there were other young people there that we had an opportunity to meet, and they had activities for us to do. So you can imagine, right out of high school, I was very impressed. But my mother continue, continued to be a very vital part of the Memphis until there were times when she no longer would drive, and she would no longer have that opportunity to go to the meetings. But the Lakes Auxiliary, um, I'm not sure that we still have Rebecca Lodge here now. James, we don't have it. Okay. But um, it was the most important part. And of course, riding the train, I have to tell you this story, rode the train to Texarkana to have my tonsils out when I was six. And the same lady went with me, and my mother didn't tell me why we were going to Texarkana. So, the Cottonelle Hospital in Texarkana, it was such a shock to me. But the best thing about it was, they gave me some ice cream. I was six years old, I started to make Do you have any questions about uh, the ladies I was doing? I know they had rituals and rules and regulations that went by, but I'm not really sure. I looked it up on the internet and I couldn't really find very much about it. Everything kind of came from kind of love. And it was mentioned in their newsletters, and it would just say, ladies on film, ladies on film. And it didn't really tell much about it. So I don't really know a lot about it. Maybe some of you might know. You can add to this for me. Any help? Okay. Yes. Two things, Rita, on your ladies of Hillary. And the other thing, did, did you know Eric Stanford? Well, yes, I did. I did know Eric Stanford. Yes. Now, are you for lady? No, I'm a, I'm a guy that wrote the book about red. Oh, you wrote the book about red. That's yeah. true. Yes. Well, the Stanford grandchildren are usually here, but they're not here. They couldn't make it this time. They couldn't make it. Uh, I think uh, the library is going to get some more issues to talk about news, and maybe we can get the Cheryl website and you can maybe keep an eye out for that. Uh, I'm sure there's some more news in there than that talk about news. There's an interesting thing about her mother. When I first came up here as a young farmer, I had a room that they were a mother. And I've got a guy sitting in the audience 
It's my brother. It was not a railroad man. <coughs> right there. That came and, and saved me when he moved to college. So they, uh, uh, they, commerce was an interesting town to, to, to come to because of all the connections with the railroad. It was just, just almost everybody was connected with it somehow or other. And I'm going to get to that just in a little bit with this audience we're going to see out there. Okay, tell them a little bit about it. The union, just tell them a little about the union roles <coughs> with the railroad. Were you a union steward or were you an average chairman? Thank you. 
everybody. Well, the Social Security Administration at that time said, well, railroaders are having a different time. So they gave them a 700 series Social Security number. Do any of you have a 700 series Social Security number? It'd be rather interesting because that was some of the first issues that came out. Uh, so that was been such a big industry. The effect of having commerce uh, was the fact that it was the industry. I was talking to the fellow here that uh, said, oh no, I remember a guy named Randy, Red Sanderberg. Well, I think everybody remembers Red. I'm uh, sure everybody remembers Dalton Martin. They were sort of household names on the railroad. Uh, and I don't know these fellas for this simple reason, like I said before. I'd take my dad up to be in the roundhouse, but they had this thing started, and I'd sit around and, you know, the old story about the guy went crazy trying to find a corner to the city. And there was one, so I mean, it started running crazy. But it was really interesting that uh, they allowed me to kind of walk around in that roundhouse while I wasn't from a dam coming off the run to be able to take the town route, which I don't remember what it was, but there's one I remember called uh, Run 43 or 343. Well, that would probably be the best run that anybody made. But uh, anyway, you know. I'd wait for him there, and then we finally wound up down to the depot because they kind of closed around the house. But what I remember is, back in those days, cell phones was not as prevalent as they are now. I think any of you here leave this, leave your house, if you don't have your cell phone, you're lost. Everything you know is on your cell phone. Your own phone number. You know, if you don't call home, you got to look on your cell phone to find out how to call home. Well, we didn't have a phone living out of the country around a community called Columbia. Nor did we really have a telephone to live out in Portland, we didn't. Um, we really didn't have a telephone when we lived in Columbia, actually. So there was a guy named Robert Patterson with the key of the mall. Every once in a while, late at night, she got a pocket on the door. Hey, Lee, you got a run to make in so and so time. And that's how he got his assignment. Was through Robert Patterson, knowing where everybody lives, and coming to the house, knocking on the door, waking them up, and tell them when they're supposed to go to work. So Robert did that for many years, and I remember that. Uh, again, that's a red. Red came here from Howard, Texas. Because the economy was bad. Well, he came to Commerce because the economy was good. It was known as a farming community, a lot of cotton. It was known as a railroad center. And then they had this little institution out there called the University. You know. So that was a thing that made Commerce attract to good people like uh, Mr. Stanford. And what happened, of course, over the years, I think I was Dick Moore's name. And by the way, I'm proud to be up here with Dick Moore and his wife. When I started school in West Hill, which is Klondike, you know, I was new there, and there was so much other grades for me to grade in front of the of me. But they kind of had to go, you know, under, you know, sort of dashing around for the I mean, you know, so I'm very proud that that's the name of them. George and uh, Cypress come pull out here and sort more of my fingers than anything else. Did I do it wrong? I'm sorry, I thought, I thought you were winning. <laughs> but you know, Commerce was the center. It had the largest switching part between Dallas and Texas County. That was one of, the, one of the things that made Commerce such an ideal place. We had the roundhouse and maintenance and all of that. And it was the major industry of Commerce. If you walk around town today and you walk down Church Street, you 
walk down Sycamore Street, you walk around Ash, and you think about all the railroad families that lived in that area of town. I remember the whole family lived on Curtis Street, there's Canterbury lived on Sycamore, uh, you know, my uncle Doc lived on Irvine A. Okay, school. So, you know, you look around and Congress was built on railroad. Unfortunately, what happened is the city railroad was not making the money they thought they were, and they won't do that for long term. Run, you know, they won't pick up a train in New York and take it to Los Angeles without a stop at the point. So that killed a lot of the industry by like putting in cars, small switching cars, uh, the, the train that came through. When I was on this, I think I was married at the time. Wait for time. Anybody remember Wait for time? Wait for called me one day and said, God, to make it up to Christ. So what do you think, Wait for? He said, they're going to kill the railroad in Congress. They're taking up the tracks, or are they taking up between Congress and, and Paris? That was a little Paris line. I some of you may remember that. And Winford got real busy talking to like, people like Senator Kane, who was our state senator at that time. Um, I can't remember who our state rep was, might have been Smith Kelly or whoever forced me up. And they started trying to figure out some way to save the railroad in Congress. They came up finally with the Northeast Texas Railroad Association. What a funny different ball is. Is he hiding now? I don't see He's not here yet. He's not here yet. Uh, but through Wilford's efforts and this organization, the Northeast Texas Railroad, they talked. Senator Kane gave him some money. And he got some money back to the state Senate to help save the railroad in Congress and started the short haul Black Man Railroad. So the Black Man Railroad again began to play a major part in the history of commerce because it helped draw industry. Uh, you look at people like Covigan, U.S. Brass, uh, American Wood, some of you remember the American Wood down in Far East Watertown, all relied on the railroad to bring them supplies. And if they had been for the railroad itself and the savings of coming out through black land, I don't think you'd see some of these industries in commerce. Today, it's not the industry it is because the main industry now is becoming small little university that uh, was the third industry to the largest industry but the railroad has now stayed cotton or farming probably still second and the railroad is turned third. But the history of commerce is always playing around cotton and South Pacific Railroad has been a vital part of, of the growth and the economic stimulus that we have in this community. And we always want to think about that. And some of you may be interested in the Congress Library has a historical history of commerce. And they say on the same time like twenty dollars. Some of you railroad people not going to talk about those because it is full of those things about Congress Railroad and Cotton Mail, the edges, some of the people and uh, things that happened back in those days. I remember reading up her organization that was trying to get a state depot. I don't know how many of you remember that. But they worked real hard and they moved it to the of Bash. They had all kinds of things working. Unfortunately, we had a couple of kids who didn't like the structure and uh, it caught fire and burned and probably had to be demolished. But uh, I'd like to talk to Jason Davis. It was sure we found to find those plans to find some way to rebuild the structure similar to the old railroad because I think it could be something that would make a great deal for this position for this community and be something to be very interesting. Well, what I'm going to do now, 
I'm going to take a little straw out through here, and I want everybody that had a connection with the cotton belt to tell who you are and what your connection was. Okay? Uh, uh, John, just to follow along after, Jason and I both are directors in the Northeast Texas School of Railroad. And so we're, we're involved with in keeping the railroad here. We have another director here, too. Yeah, another, yeah, I forgot that. Here's our director, Nathan. And then here. Uh, Betty Martin Reeder. Okay. My name is Betty Martin Reeder, and I'm Dobby Martin's daughter. Um, I just happen to be here from Iowa, and so this is my first time to attend the symposium, and I was so tickled because railroad was one of the most important parts of our family. You were either a railroad man or you were a teacher. That's just the way it was. And we knew that that's the way it was going to be. So my sister and I became teachers. Well, we couldn't be railroad men, but we tried. So I remember it so fondly and was always up with my dad when he would get a call. And, and the railroad ran right behind our house, but we were one of those over on sick. It was, and our aunt, this Reba Eisenhower is our aunt, but it would be my dad's, my dad's sister. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Linda Martin Harper, and my dad was Donnie Martin, and my grandfather, who I did not realize, because he got here before I was born, was J.L. Martin. And so it, it, we took a long railroad family, and like you said, we're teachers also, you could be a road or your teacher, and so we became teachers. And then I married Larry Tom Harper, who's uncle, Robert Patterson. And a lot of times when they would call, daddy worked late at night, and I was a kid when we had to the road. I answered, he fell asleep, daddy didn't get called, so Robert came to the door, patting on the door to get my daddy awake to go work. And I really remember that one. <laughs> so I tried not to answer the phone during the late night hours. So anyway, it's very good to be here. This is my second or third or fourth time to come, and I'm really looking really for this. It's good to have these two here. Uh, uh, you, want, you want to tell them who you are? <laughs> we really want to marry we really weren't married when I worked with the railroad, so she never did have a railroad man that was a Thank you. 
went to Dallas. We moved there about <coughs> almost a year. And then we moved to, to the urban. And I got a job at the Grand Fairways. And we lived there 21 years. And finally, I decided I'd quit. Moved back to East Texas. So I, I live right now, I'm living in Cumbie. About 30, 35 years now. And I've been doing I'm James H. Hill. Uh, I was born and raised in Congress. My dad worked for the SB and then went for Cotton Belt. And he spent uh, something like about 34, 35 years. I don't, I'm not sure just how long. But I was, like I said, born and raised here. We lived down on Cattle Street, which is about a block off the railroad track. And I grew up with train whistles blowing all the time. And anytime I had anyone to spend the night with me, They'd stay awake all night because the train was coming by. <laughs> and they'd ask me, how'd you sleep? I said, it's just as sound as I could sleep. Didn't bother me a bit. And you know, occasionally we go down to uh, Marshall. Uh, not Marshall. Well, the Jefferson, down Jefferson. And, and spend a night or two down there. And you know, there's a train that blows all night down there now. And my wife, they wake all the time down there, and it, it, it still didn't bother me to hear the train was in my sleep. And you know, the railroad was probably as good as anything that ever happened in commerce. It was as sad as anything that ever happened in commerce when they went out. You know, because just like the one before me, the commerce. You either connect it with the university or college, whatever it might be, that you have that, or the railroad. Unless you have a little bottom and pop business in commerce. You know, and, and it, it was like that. It's either the railroad or the university that well, like commerce was made up of. And all the trains coming in and out to the roundhouse the down there, working on those as well as the rails, the trains running back and forth. My dad was a, a assistant foreman or foreman in the rail system for ever since I could remember, really. You know, uh, he was working for the railroad when I was born. He worked, uh, he retired in, I don't remember what year he retired, but it was uh, I guess it was sometime in the, uh, the late 60s or early 70s was when he retired. But anyway, you know, it was, the railroad was a good college. The railroad was good for my family, just like these systems of Timco, whatever you want to call it. I was with Timco in 1951, the Grand Prairie. These systems raised my family with me. The railroad raised daddy's family for us. There was five of us children. And the railroad, we worked with the railroad all the time. And, I had forgotten about the Social Security and the railroad retirement, but they couldn't have, at the time of this such place, they either selected to have railroad retirement or Social Security, and they couldn't have both of them. Now, I don't know what the situation is now, you know, time and time change, changed, but at the time that this took effect, back in the 30s, the railroad employees had their choice. Either go with the railroad retirement or go with Social Security. And that was the reason for all the different numbers. So that they could tell which one selected railroad retirement and which one selected Social Security. But, Reba, your mother was passed on the grant of Rebecca in Congress. I can't remember what the number of the lodge was, but she was the passed on the grant. Now, as far as in the Rebecca order itself, uh, that was the latest order of the Oddballs. And as far as the Rebecca order itself, I don't know what she might have been. You know, she could have been passed by Gerard or whatever, you know, I don't know. But she was passed no the grand in the Oddballs. I think it was Rebecca's in college. I remember that now, that's probably why she was delegate to the National Convention in San Francisco that I found. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, because
because they went, the odd fellows still do it, Rebecca do too, they go all over the, the, the odd fellows are worldwide organization, 26 different countries they're in. And it's a fair size order, and people don't really realize how, how big they are. But anyway, it's, uh, it's a shame we lost our Rebecca Superior College. And uh, my dad and my uncle, my dad was the oldest in his family, and Uncle Britton was the youngest in his family. Both of them worked for the railroad for years and years and years. And as far as I know, they're the only ones who ever worked for the railroad. None of us children did. We all worked in the aircraft industry. So there you go, you know. It's, it's in transportation one way or the other. And, and this guy right here, hey, we've kind of had association through the years. I was a, worked as an engineer, at, a design engineer at LTP at one A. It was East, yeah, when I went there. Yeah, we had, we had several names even when I was there for a short time. Let's see, now who am I missing up here? Yeah, here's one right here. I'm Bill Kennedy, and I am truly a uh, product of railroad employees. My granddaddy was J.B. Odom, my uncle was Harvey Fitzgerald, and I have another uncle that was Lee Smith. They were all three railroad employees. And my dad was Riley Kennedy, and he was a workman on the Cotton Belt Route. And some of my fondest memories are going down to the caboose on Saturday morning. My lady had a reputation for being a chef. <coughs> and Ray and I had talked about this. He prepared meals for the crew. We may make a run to Texas County or there's no place over close to Bull Work called Hodge. But my job on Saturday morning was mopping the caboose. But anyway. It's real good to be here and see each one of them. I'm going to tell a quick story about his dad, Riley. <clears throat> we were working the South Local one night. It was during his night, dark. And Glenn Paint over by Addison had put in a spur, but the spur entered from the wrong way when we were going south. Nobody had ever performed the operation they call dropping a car in that spur before. So the engineer was a guy named Doyle Herman. And uh, so he and Riley, Riley said, ah, Doyle, I think we dropped that thing in there. Well, we got up and, and the operation was that you cut loose from your train and you had that single car behind the engine. And the engine took off extremely fast and the brake one pulled him in. You ran away from him, and the car was cut loose on its own. And here's Riley up on there with the, the handbrake. Boy, he was cranking on that handbrake and cranking. And dog dog, he said, I don't think he's going to get her stopped. But he got it stopped about all two or three feet before he was about to run off the end of the track. So that, that was kind of a dangerous place because he was down here. We always had a good time about that, too. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, I'll catch him on what I saw in the thing. Let's see. Here's one right over here. Now, if I, if I miss somebody, let me know. Bill, so you are in there. My name's James Hawkins, and my father was uh, Roy Hawkins. He worked for our road. My uncle, Joe Hawkins, was an engineer. And I have an uncle with uh, Dale Sparks. I can remember back when we used to take our daughter down there when, when my dad would come in on the run and he'd get her up on the caboose and he'd let her ride with him like that. I don't think he's supposed to, but he'd let her ride and a little bit. So uh, anyway, I, I remember the railroad and long memories. Now you tell us how you were connected. I'm Ann Hawkins' pal, and my dad was railroader, James' dad. 
And uh, we also had a granddaddy that worked on the road construction crew. So we had quite a lot of railroaders in our family. And we've always loved the railroad. Been a hobby about. Anybody over there in this area over here this that if you're, if you're currently working for a railroad or have other ties on another road, you want to say something? I don't do that. I think there's a this man right here. Yeah, I, I get, I'm gonna get him when I go back around there. Okay. I think you. Have, uh, I am not uh, from Commerce. I've only lived here three years, but my father worked for the Cotton Belt. In Waco, he worked at the Brown House, and that was where he worked when I was born. And um, he, when the Depression hit in '29, the railroad had Cotton Belt had to let my father go. They didn't call it fire him, but they let him go because he had been the last one hired to work at the roundhouse and so he was the first one they let go so that uh, i feel i have a connection to the cotton belt but not especially to the commerce version of the cotton house uh, i noticed some of your people said they had to have places to room uh, on the Southern Pacific, where I grew up, the section foreman's house was furnished, and it was painted yellow, just like the the uh, uh, depots were. And I think that the railroads were the ones that brought civilization to us out here in the outback. Uh, you know. They, the railroads would send, they would buy the right of ways and then they would send a surveyor in. And with my mother's family, there was a man who surveyed, determined where the towns would be. Uh, and it was determined by the railroad uh, mileage. Uh, and I also feel that the railroads determined where some of our colleges were located. Most colleges were located on railroad lines. For example, College Station, Texas, originally was just a depot out in the boonies where the Aggies disembarked to go to college. Of course, now it's quite a town and I don't know my way around anymore. But, uh, and I graduated from Mary Harden Baylor in Belton and it was the same situation in that they had a station there that they called Baylor Station or Belton Station and it was where the students disembark to go into the dorms uh, and of course it wasn't called Mary Harden in the early days it was called Baylor Belton I think because it was a branch of Baylor University but um, uh, and you know the mail used to we had to depend on the railroad to bring the mail and I remember the mail car and uh, the uh, little community that I lived in, the mail carrier had to hang the mail bag on a rack, I don't know what you call it, and uh, the fellow in the mail car would snatch it in and usually throw out the mail and the um, postal person would pick up this bag and take it. In our case, the post office was in the store, a little section of the store, and there was a storekeeper's wife that was the male person. But uh, I, I feel a real connection to railroad people. My um, 
uh, on my paternal mother, my grandmother on my paternal side were all railroad people and they helped build the railroads, uh, lay the tracks, uh, and they, uh, their great grandfather was born in Pennsylvania. He ended up in Texas and they built the railroad that brought them here. Thank you. For that inside, I know you have one. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get Phil close to the on this side, and then John Ballard, I'm coming over to you. I'm Bill Rosen. I'm just saying that. I'm Bill Rosen, and I'm uh, working at Cottonville. For one summer, I worked on the ring and clerk, and then. I got, got it in my blood a little bit, and I hired out a little later in the engine service. I was going to fire him. And uh, I saw Harley a lot of times, and uh, he was ahead of me in the seniority. I had an uncle that lived next door to me. He was a fireman on the KCS, which was L back then. He didn't take engineer promotion, he just stayed a fireman until he retired. Then I had another uncle that was uh, breaking on the cotton belt. And so um, I remember when he left the railroad, I don't remember. I think he got laid off here after the war or something, so he went into something else. And he gave me his uh, um, Hamilton Railway special uh, pocket watch that he used, that they had to have. And so um, I still have it. And so um, when I worked for cotton belt, I, uh, I already had a watch, so I didn't have to buy one. I used that one, and, and so that watch rolled the rails into the other pockets, you might say. And so uh, I had a lot of fun memories and conversation with Harley. Uh, like, you know, we, whenever we go to the depot or a bunch of guys sitting around, either coming in on the train or taking one out, um, I remember the expression, I don't know if Harley remembers or not. I heard him say one time, we have a tall ring. I'm sure you know. Him say, then I think someone was, uh, another time someone was talking about they'd seen this tall blonde lady or something. And Harley said, that's what you call a high yard. So anyway, uh, um, and I also, um, David and Davis and I over there, we worked for Wayne Deacon's boss when he opened up my plans, and so I got to be an engineer. So I finally made it to an engineer, but I had to work for a short line. So anyway, that's kind of my history of uh, railroad. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, Bill, it's been a while. Been a while. What what he was talking about there when you worked over on the, on the main line, which was centralized traffic control, you worked completely on by signals. And what you, you knew, that if you had a high green, that you were clear to go. And then if you had a yellow, that meant to proceed and be able to stop the next signal. And that might be blinking, which means that you're going to go in a siding something or another. Or it might be red, and guess what that means? It means stop before you get to that signal. But you usually got one before that. Let's see, now who over here? John? Okay, yeah, John is over here. It, it, this guy right here, he, well, I think I had seniority on him, too. My name is John Ballard. I hired out the first time on <clears throat> April 19th, 1961. And then cut off as a fireman on May the 7th, 1964, when Wally Sherrard was on television as an astronaut claiming we need to get rid of all the feather banners. But anyway, they hired back on February the 20th, 1970 as a fireman, went to Pine Bluff and took rules exam and then promoted to engineer uh, <coughs> June the 11th, 1971 and worked for until 1998 when I retired December 31st, 1998, 31 years. 
I'll tell you another story. We worked at Greenville Dodger in Commerce to, to, to Greenville. That's all it did, is to work those two places. So occasionally they would have us unload rock. And uh, in doing unloading the rock, I guess I did a good job because the roadmaster told me that I ran it slow enough that the guys could walk on the side and turn the cranks and let the rock fall out. And he said, I'm gonna buy your lunch. So we go about seven blocks and tie the engine down on the, on the main line and we're covered by a train or um, uh, what we call an unconditional uh, train or. <clears throat> so we go in this restaurant, we wait about 20 minutes and here comes the conductor and the brakeman, but uh, Murray Taylor and Bubba Ferris. They got off to talk to somebody and we ran off and left them. So they had to walk about seven blocks to go to the restaurant. So they were really ticked off at us. But that's about it. I had a situation like that one time that guy I worked with Cowboy Moore. Some of you might have known Cowboy. We were in Sulphur Springs, he's an engineer, and a guy named uh, Friday Lines was a conductor in Portland Whitley. It was a great one on the rear end. So we stopped in Sulphur Springs to switch to uh, Carnation Bill plant over there. Had a long train. And uh, you you switch you switch Carnation no matter if they needed to be switched. If you had a hundred car train that was due in Dallas, you stopped and either set out or you picked up the Carnation because Mr. Plummer had a lot of pull with the railroad. A lot of you see these pictures. And Mr. Plummer, he would get on the engines and the engineers would let him run the engine and do his switching and whatever. But the story was, these guys saw something out and they liked it. So that was before we had communications. We had radios, but nobody used them because it wasn't part of the union contract. Uh, yeah, because see that, what they did, that when you had a long train of say, 50 cars or whatever, it took three or four guys if you were trying to switch that train to pass the hand signals. But anyway, so Cowboy, he whistles off. He said, I don't see him. And he whistles off and waited. And we went. So sure enough, when we got to Mount Pleasant, they had got the station agent in Sulphur Springs to take them because we ran off the bedroom. So it was kind of a thing that happened every now and then. Anybody else over here? I don't, I don't want to miss it, so nobody. Do you see somebody else? Uh, I'm just going to leave it. Let me tell you. Let me see. Okay. But you, who is, you're, you work with which one? Railroad? You, are you with Railroad? No. Okay, all right. Are you, no, you're with Dar, aren't you? Okay, here's a man who works with dark, which is railroad. Okay, so. Uh, oh, okay, you work on the park. Okay. Well, Mr. Timekeeper, how do we look? We got a little time, or do you need to? Is it break time? I don't know, what time is it? Well, I have a couple. Let's throw it. If you got a minute there, put that. Uh, there's a picture or two over here I want some folks to see that they might recognize some folks on there, okay? And we, we, there's a, a little trivia thing. While he's doing that, uh, Mr. Kennedy here, he alluded to cleaning up the caboose. And why, and that was, the caboose was part of the trainman's contract. They were able to do that. Here you see a picture, this is by Mr. Ed Cooper, who's in here, and Jason, can we kill the lights over here, maybe? Where is he? Okay, so we might dial. Thank you. Hey, it's Rob. Right. Can, can any of you recognize any of the folks on here? If you do, later on, will this uh, tell us who you might have recognized, who this crew was? Anybody? This, this, Ed, what year was this you took that picture? 
Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I see it now. Okay, in 72. Okay. I was, it was like my second day of taking. I wasn't used to the light. Yeah. Had okay. I had this old Argus camera, no timer, no nothing. So it was way overexposed. The big fella on the left, somebody put a spot in the tie and one plug and just struck it on the money. He was right on the money. Mm -hmm. But oh. I watched these guys work for a couple minutes and I snapped his face. Come on in here, Jim. Don't come in. Uh, what, uh, I'll, I'll ask the question here. The, the guys that worked on the, that did the maintenance on right away and, and in the rails, in the early days, they had a name for them. They called them Gandy Dancers. And there have been some things about how that got its name. And I think you see, you see the, the gentleman on the left, the big guy, do you see that bar in his hand? That, and what he's doing, I think he was getting ready to, to get behind a cross tie that they had just taken loose and, and that he's getting ready to push it out. They're going to replace that tie. That uh, tool was, it's, it's a bar, I think it was five feet long and it was made by a company called Gandhi. And Gandhi also made other uh, tools that was used in, in track maintenance. And they call them, and these guys, there's, if you ever want to know about them, you can go on the internet and find a lot of stuff about Gandhi dancers. And they have some really neat videos on there. These guys would actually put the, bend the rail a little bit or whatever to align the track. And, and what they did, they did it in unison and they had a caller that would say, give me a quarter or give me an eighth. And that meant that he wanted to move that much. And it'd be about six or eight guys all with, with, the, with the gandy there. And they would hit that all at the same time and they'd move it. It's a neat thing if you ever want to Okay, Jason, give me another one. Okay, now this is, okay, this was the, uh, the tool house and they kept a motor car here too. Is that right, James? Well, that the, yeah, that was right. Uh, uh, do you recognize anybody on that? Is that your dad on the left? Yeah, I believe it is. Yeah, I, I think it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize anybody else there? Uh, where, I believe you're supposed to be here today. I was going to ask him if he recognized. And so that was their number, Section 205. And like somebody had said, uh, I don't, they work probably toward uh, uh, Ridgeway and maybe halfway to Greenville or thereabouts, is about what they did for their work. And they worked in the, uh, in the yards a lot. They worked all the yeah, they worked all of them down as they needed to. Okay, Jason, give me another one. Uh, here is a picture here, and it's over in the Salt Springs area, and you can see some of the other tools. One, one still of one of the big hand tools is on the left, and that is a big jack, a big railroad jack, and some of those are still around. And uh, uh, Leroy, didn't Dad have one of those? You still have it. You still have that one. Okay. He, it, we, it wasn't. I don't know where he picked it up, but Dad, I remember the old railroad jack when we. And, and you said you still have it, that's great. But this guy, these guys here were a bridge gang. And uh, a lot of times they moved around quite a bit. In fact, they had, uh, uh, they had their own cars to sleep in and to eat in and do sorts of things when they were moving up and down doing their work there. Okay, Jason, you got another one there? And here again is that same bridge gang. And, and I'm trying to decide what this guy on the right was doing. It looked like he was trying to align something the way he's down there. I'm not sure. But we don't, is, and I think maybe in the hand of the guy in the middle is a, uh, a spy, a spy camera. I'm not sure. Okay, give me another guess. You might mention that's the east side of uh, Sulphur Springs looking back to Carnation. It's not happening? 
Did you not mention that's on the east side of Sulphur Springs that's looking back towards the Carnation North Plant? Oh, that, okay. That, oh, that's what you said. He's telling me that that was the Carnation Milk Plant. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You see all the thing over the back. We talked about the guy that uh, was there. The, he was the CEO, I think, of that Carnation plant, and his name was Plummer. And he was he's a real famous photographer of uh, of rail operations, engines, that sort. Okay, can you give me that one? Now this this is an example, probably taken a little bit later. Anybody recognize that? This is a they was working. I don't exactly know what this was, but I know this was a game. And what you see there, that they're moving a rail right there. And see the tong. If you see the tongs in their hand, it took a man on each side. And uh, they talked about in the early days of you know that when they was laying that. A rail, some of that rail weighed as much as a hundred. Well, most of the rail through here was 112 pounds to the yard. So that can tell you a 39 foot piece of uh, a steel would be pretty heavy for for a group of men to move. Yes, ma'am. I, I really can't tell you that, but I can get, tell you that in the winter, on a real cold day, you, it, it would be probably something like three-eighths of an inch at least. And then on a hot July day, they would be buddy together. Yeah, exactly. It, it, yeah, it took care of the expansion because otherwise it would have gone off. But then they got the laying rail by the quarter, quarter miles at a time with, with welding rail. Uh, but nobody recognizes anybody. Okay, Justin, one, Jason, one more. Uh, yeah, that's a clicker. That's, that's right, the click, clack, clack. And this, these guys are on a motor car, and we do know the guy on the right over there is a brakeman conductor named Norris Warren. And do we know who this person would be on the left? James, is that looking about like you know? And there's, we don't really know. Some people think this guy was a guy named Ray Elliott, but I'm, I don't know where that's right. But they were going out to work. I'm sure they were working on the work train because they, I know he was a brakeman, and he would have been out there with the train to be sure that it got in the clear if it needed to get in the clear. Okay, just maybe one more. And we'll, here's a bridge gang, and, and we don't know, Cheryl, we, we don't know where this one is was taken with its own con I don't recognize that. I don't recognize that bridge. But it's probably somewhere on the cotton belt. But that gives you an idea. They were all structural steel put together with the rivets. See all of the rivets in there? You see all of the rivets. And there's a do what? I, I don't know. It may may not be. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, oh yeah, maybe I'll take your can on the red. You, you might be right going going north. But anyway, this was this was probably taken. It looks like it would have probably been in the twenties or, or before when they did it. There's a name on there, but we don't know. Somebody kind of recognized that name, but we don't really know. But that gives you an idea. This this just gives you an idea that there was more to railroads. Then engineers and conductors and brakemen and firemen. It, in fact, the, the major part of the rail forces probably were not in not in train operation. Yes. Uh, you know, these bridges were really uh, engineering masterpieces, and uh, the people who designed those really had it all together. Yes, and then. This gentleman right over here, it, it's kind of, it, it tell them who you are and what, and what you do. Yes, sir. You're really embarrassed. Yeah. My name is Milo Tung, and uh, I'm a new professor in the construction engineering program here, and uh, I have no connection with Cottonville Railroad. The reason why I uh, and interesting that because 
I would like to do some research uh, for this railroad based on um, uh, infrastructure sustainability. Yeah, hopefully, I can gather enough information for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful uh, conference. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I'm from Taiwan originally. I'm Chinese. Somebody else says, okay, one more, Jason. We'll, we'll get it. And here's just a picture of a section gang early days. This would have been on the old Texas Midland, I think. It says Cash. That's down south of Greenville. Okay, Jason, this was this was a motor car. Huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get it. Okay, go, go, Jason, one more. To, to the hand car. Go to the hand car if you get to it. Or if you missed it. Yeah, there it is. So there's a, a manually operated. We, we won't steal the thunder from the rail motor cars here. And now, one more. There's a question I want to ask on this other one, maybe. What time of the year was this taken? What time of the year was it taken? Well, I've been told that that, it, that looks like snow, doesn't it? But that's not snow from what I've been told. That was, this was in the days when they were burning coal, and those are cinders. That, that's what I've been told. I thought it was probably snow, but, but uh, did, Cheryl, did you tell me that that was cinders? Yes, she did. She, and Cheryl is the, she's the resident, uh, historian at the, at the library, so she's researched this. And maybe there's, that, where there's two of this, this gives you an idea about how the roundhouse was, and, and I thought it was unique that uh, it looked like snow to me. And it was, I think that was a 10 stall roundhouse, I'm not sure. Okay, I got one more guy over here or two that I need to, well, this one here, he's going he's gonna to talk to us quite a bit here. I'll just let you, but I'll get old Gary over here. Well, I'm Gary uh, uh, I didn't work for the Cotton Bell, but I grew up out on the far west end of the Cotton Bell at Gatesville. The Cotton Bell, as many people may or may not know, but actually as far west as Stephenville and Comanche. I went out to Gatesville, my hometown, to Hamilton, and split west of there, and had branches over to Comanche. Out toward West Texas, sort of, and then up to Stevenville. So, uh, as a child, I was interested in the railroads, all everyone knew. And the Cotton Belt came to, by that time in my life, uh, it was down to three days a week. I had a local that came over from Waco, that was based in Waco. So, I got to know the, the crew, became friends with them, and uh, took some pictures there the last couple of years, realizing there that it was getting toward the end. They did announce and up abandoning the line when I was about 15 years old. So, uh, want to work the railroad and having that in my blood just from letting them let me ride and help them switch and stuff as a kid. I just, that's all I ever wanted to do. So, I went down to Temple where they had a bigger terminal and worked for Santa Fe Railways. I would still work for their successor, which is BNSF. And I'm working over the engineer with them. But uh, I still have a a real fondness for the Cotton Bell. I uh, try to study and uh, collect things from the Cotton Bell and the, uh, try to make it up here every year. Uh, you guys have a, a real uh, connection to the Cotton Bell that, uh, that uh, I can relate to. So I appreciate y'all having this every year and it's always find it really interesting. I appreciate it. You may think it is here that uh, Gary owns some Cotton Bell uh, rolling stock. He owns one of one of the cabooses that worked out of here on the old Sherman Local. Sherman Local was a mixed train. It would and it was a caboose and, and that caboose would haul twenty four people, you tell me. And he's in the process now of restoring that and you brought it from way up on the east coast somewhere again. Connecticut, okay. And he also had you told me you have another kind of caboose too. Yeah, one of the last ones they bought was 
37, it was a steel car, one of the wide vision of Kipolo. And uh, so I've got two cotton belt producers and a cotton belt depot in Mound, Texas, which is near Gatesville. And it's the local post office, but uh, we're in the process of restoring it back to uh, the way it would have been in 1926 when it was built. And so trying to preserve the cotton belt history. Yeah, well, uh, the guy was here last night, but he had to be somewhere else. A guy named Tony Wilson. And Jason, does Tony own the Dixie? Yes. He own, Tony owns the one of the uh, executive cars, the rail cars, that the Cottonbell had, the Dixie. And the Fairlane, if people are familiar with, was another rail car that the Cottonbell had that once had been bought, I think, belonged to Henry Ford. Back in his early life. And that, Ed, is that something right about that? That's what's called Fairlane. Yeah, that's yeah. what's about Yeah, okay. Yeah, you feel. Yeah. Huh? It was either for the bridge, or he had it built. He had it built. He had it built. Okay. Let him know what he's talking about. Okay, Jason, what, what's our time? I don't know. It's a timekeeper. You don't even have a watch. I don't have one either. I got it myself. Yeah, somebody talked about phones. I turned my cell phone on. I don't know time. <laughs> you know. Okay, so we're just about on time. Right? Yeah. He says we're right, right, right on time. Okay. We we any, anybody? Now. Yeah. It's Looks like we've got some coffee here, maybe, for the bride. And uh, I, I, we, I've been, I'm really thinking about this kind of a format okay. to do. This. John, you want to say something? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was saying you're thinking about what we talk about her road and commerce. Uh, and maybe you can fill it in later the plan for the Northeast Texas now as rail passengers between here and dark. Since we we got free now, I understand money is still available to the Congress to build that bridge. They can open up the dark line on that end of here in Summer Springs. And then there's the other thing, how many of you remember a little station down at the Depot that Make the ship store on one side and get Shipley on the other. And then you had uh, the blizzard that on the service station right there was all together uh, because there was a working house in the shipping uh, building. She had a little general store there and just right ships on sandwiches and things like that for passengers. So all those structures are gone, but they're still part of the economy. And part of the economy, too, remember, is the highway between here and Sherman. That's the old Cottonville Road to Sherman, and they made it into something we could use to a lot of us. And I know most of us go up to Durant and visit for lunch here once in a while, and that's probably the way you go. So it's still a lot of economic value of Cottonville. Yeah, well, there's uh, there's there's things as he's mentioned that there's some things in the works with with the northeast section of the rural rail district, but some of them are you know uh, you, we Jason and I spent a lot of time writing some proposals and some things that haven't happened yet, but we hope to get that rail line back up to what's called Class Two. Okay, <coughs> but we're not we're not there yet. We're, we're still working. Okay, every time everybody take a break. And then we'll be back at what, 11 o'clock? And, uh, and we'll continue with, um, with Bill Baker.